Praise the Lord. Uh, welcome Kingdom Builders to this uh, Kingdom of God and Kingdom uh, Builders class this morning. Thank you all for uh, joining online. Also welcome to our e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture later on. Um, last uh, Wednesday, we began studying Chapter 7, um, the publication, The Kingdom of God, and we began studying uh, the chapter on Kingdom Parables. We looked at what is the meaning of parables, and we also saw what why Jesus spoke to people in parables, and uh, we uh, studied or looked at uh, the first parable that Jesus spoke of the uh, uh, sower and the seeds, which is in Matthew chapter 13. Uh, today we'll continue with um, looking at various parables. Uh, in Matthew chapter 13, there are a whole lot of other parables that Jesus spoke. So we'll uh, look at those parables, we'll study them, and also we'll look at a few other uh, parables this morning. Uh, before we continue with chapter 7 uh, and study the parables, can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Thank you, Diksha. Thank you, Father, Lord, thank you for this time. Lord Jesus, we give thanks, Lord, for the study that we are going to do, Lord. Help us, and Lord, open our hearts and mind, Lord Jesus. And Lord, whatever we will listen, Lord, help us to follow that and help us to keep that kingdom mindset in us, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the time, Lord, and I surrender our faculties in your hand, Lord. Speak through them, Lord Jesus, Lord, and help them, Lord, give your wisdom and knowledge to them, Lord. All glory, honor, we submit to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Diksha. So we look at uh, uh, the other parables that Jesus uh, uh, spoke in Matthew chapter 13. So we looked at the sower and the seeds. And uh, we look at the other parables. We look at uh, verses 31 to uh, 33. <clears throat> so can somebody please read uh, verse, sorry, not 31 to 33. Uh, yeah, we'll go ahead with the uh, with that, but before that, we have. Can you please read uh, Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 30 and 36 to 43. So can somebody please read Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 30 and 36 to 43, please. Shall I go ahead, sister? Yes. Matthew 13, 24 to 30 and 36 to 43. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How, does, how then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and to gather them up? But he said, No, please while you gather up the taste, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the taste and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the taste of the field. He answered and said to them, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. 
Therefore, as the days are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be ailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is the word of God. Amen. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, so Jesus begins this parable uh, and he says the kingdom of heaven is like, what is the kingdom of heaven like? What does he say? A man who sowed good seed in the field. Yes, it's like a man who sowed good seeds in his field. Okay. And then uh, there's a enemy who comes and what does he sow in the field? There's. Yes, he sows the bad seeds. Okay. And all of a sudden in uh, this man's field where he's sown the good seeds, he finds, you know, the good things growing, the wheat that is growing, but he also finds the tares that are growing. So his workers and his people come to him and say, you know, uh, can we go and clean up the field right now? But what does he say? Not to clean up the field. Yes. Why? Because? When they grow up all together, they can clean up the tares. Okay, so he's uprooting the good ones also. Yes, so he says, don't do that now because when you uproot the tears, okay, uh, it will, uh, you know, it will destroy the good plants as well. So I was looking at why, you know, it tears are mentioned here and not weeds. Can anyone tell me why the Bible is mentioned as tears and not weeds? You know what are weeds, right? We see in open fields there are a lot of plants that are like weeds that are growing. But why is it mentioned tears here? Anyone has any answer to that? Okay, the tears basically look very similar to the wheat plant. They're very identical. They also have like, you know, uh, 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 it's so identical that it looks like a wheat plant with, you know, uh, the, the corn of uh, wheat just growing or uh, the grains growing on top of the, uh, or the head of the plant. So it's just very similar to that. And that is why it's not mentioned as weeds, but it's mentioned as um, uh, tears here. And so we see that, you know, uh, the enemy comes and sows things that are so identical uh, to the kingdom of God, which is so identical to what God is doing. And so he sows those uh, bad things. And so uh, the workers come and say, can we clean up the field right now? And the owner says, no, don't do that. Because when you pull it out, you will destroy the good um, uh, plants as well. So he says, let them grow together. And in the time of the harvest comes, you know, um, uh, 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 the owner says, I will send my reapers and they will sort out the good from the bad and they will get rid of the uh, bad ones. Okay. So Jesus speaking this parable to the people and his disciples are not able to understand the meaning of this parable. So they come to him and say, please explain to us this parable and maybe they're telling Jesus yeah we know that this is a story from our world yes we understand this whole thing about farming but what is the spiritual truth you're trying to convey uh, to us and so Jesus explains to them the spiritual truth so he says the man who sowed the good seed who is the man who sowed the good seed Jesus Christ Yes, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So he's the one who sowed the good seeds. And uh, who are the good seeds? Who we believers. Yes. Uh, the sons of the kingdom, the sons and the daughters of the kingdom of God. We are the good seeds and we are sown into this uh, world. 
So it's important for us to look at ourselves and begin to perceive and look and think of ourselves as good seeds, which means to perceive and to think of ourselves as sons and daughters of the kingdom of God. So you need to look at yourself and say, hey, I'm a son and daughter of the kingdom of God. Um, I'm a good seed that, you know, God has sown or planted in this world and we know that in this world that that you know we are not alone there are also bad seeds and who's sowing the who's the enemy here devil yes satan or uh, the devil who's also sowing the bad seeds which are the wicked people and we are in the midst of these wicked people okay but God has sown us here for a purpose. So you can say if, okay, if there are bad people here on this world, you know, then why did God sow us here in this world? You know, um, uh, or, you know, why are we part of this world here? You know, God has put us here for a purpose, for a reason. So we are sons and daughters of the kingdom in this earth. We have a kingdom mandate on our life. Okay, and we've already seen what is a kingdom mandate, what God has called us uh, to do. Uh, we are here to, you know, release the kingdom of God. We're here to bring, uh, you know, do God's will as it is in heaven here on earth. We're here to release the kingdom authority, the kingdom culture, the kingdom presence, the kingdom reign and rule of the king uh, in the sphere of uh, the world that we are living in. We're here to release the kingdom of God amidst this wicked uh, generation. So we need to understand uh, why we are here. We are not here just because, uh, you know, we are born on this earth or, you know, because our parents wanted us, but we are here for a specific reason. There's a greater, a bigger plan. God has a specific plan for each one of our lives and God has a general plan. So even if our specific plan is you know, whether we are work, we are doing business or we are in the corporate world or we are a teacher or a housewife, you know, a housemaker, whatever, you know, we, uh, God has a, a specific uh, plan for us, but he also has a general purpose in the plan. And our general purpose in the plan is that we go and preach and teach and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is the um, uh great commission and the kingdom mandate is to uh you know release the kingdom of god here uh, in the in the sphere of influence that god has uh, placed us in so we are sons and daughters of the kingdom we need to understand why we are here we are here because we are sons and daughters of the kingdom and the son of god has you know uh, intended that in such a time as this that you know uh, he would put us as good seed in the places that he has put you. So in your family, in your locality, uh, in your community, in your city, in your town, uh, in your village, in your state, the country that he has put you in, the office that he has put you in, among the group of people that he has put you in. You know, uh, God has put you there as a good seed because he wants his kingdom to thrive and to flourish. He wants his kingdom uh, 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 culture, his kingdom thinking, his kingdom lifestyle to just infiltrate, to penetrate and to move and for you to have an influence in this world uh, which is uh, full of evil and corruption and uh, 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 and wickedness that is there and he wants us to release his kingdom uh, principles his kingdom rule and reign and his presence here uh, uh, on this earth so we need to see ourselves as that good seed and uh, Jesus is saying that there is a harvest time that is coming that is the end of the age and who are the reapers here who are the reapers the angels Yes, the angels, they are the reapers. And he's saying that the angels will come at the time of judgment and, uh, you know, uh, 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 and, uh, you know, they will come and gather the harvest and, you know, they will also be part of the judgment that is going to happen. And he's, Jesus is saying the end is coming when I will vindicate 
you know, I will separate the good seeds from the bad seeds and the bad seeds will be thrown into uh, eternal fire, into uh, hell, where there be wailing and gnashing of um, teeth, okay? So he says, this is what is going to happen uh, during the end of the age. And so Jesus is telling the people that they are the good seed and the purpose why God has sown them, them uh, sown them in uh, that season or in that part of time or that uh, time in history is because he wants them to, you know, uh, uh, bring about his kingdom here on earth. So that is the purpose that, you know, God has placed us here as good seeds in this world and we are here with a with a specific plan and a purpose that God has for us and this is our specific plan and purpose okay so Jesus continues with the more parables so we'll continue looking at um, uh, the same chapter Matthew chapter 13 verses 47 through verse 50 so can somebody read verses 47 to 50 please where Jesus brings about the same truth uh, using another story which is very familiar to the people in that region that he was talking to. So Matthew 13, 47 through 50. Can somebody read that, please? Can I read, sister? Sure, please. Uh, the dragnet, Matthew 13, 47 to 50. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind. Uh, which when it was full, they drew to show, and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Amen. Thank you. Um so Jesus is reiterating the truth that he has just spoken of in the good and the bad seeds parable. And so he's using a, a, a story of, uh, you know, fishing story here, which is very familiar to the people in that region. So he uh, uses a simple fisherman story to tell us or to describe to us, you know, what will happen at the end of the age. And he says that, you know, um, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a big net, okay? Uh, a big fishing net that is cast into the sea and there are all kinds of fish. And so when the fishermen come back to shore, they separate the good ones from the uh, bad ones and they throw away that what is the bad ones and they keep the uh, good ones. Okay. So, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the question is when that big fishing net is thrown in and everyone is, you know, uh, into that place of that judgment day, you know, uh, there will be a separation, okay? Uh, so the question we need to ask ourselves is uh, where will we where will we be, whether we'll be with the good fish or the bad fish, you know? Or uh, maybe you're saying, hey, I will be the good fish, okay, uh, that will be gathered into the kingdom. Uh, but what about you know, your loved ones, what about people around you, you know, uh, uh, you know, they are going to be thrown away into the furnace of fire. So what are we going to do about that? You know, uh, we have a responsibility. It's not just, hey, we have this privilege. Okay, I'm going to be part of the kingdom of God. I'm part of the, already part of the kingdom of God. I'm also going to be part of the eternal kingdom of God. But, you know, um, it's important for us to even consider people around us because God is a gracious, compassionate, merciful, loving God. And he does not want anyone to be lost. And it's good, pleasing, perfect will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Okay. So uh, the question we can ask ourselves is, will we be the good fish that we gather into kingdom or the bad fish? So, you know, that will be thrown into the uh, furnace of fire, you know. So we can answer and say, hey, I'm the good fish, but what about the bad fish that will be thrown or be there will be eternal separation from God, even as they're thrown in um, hell. So 
uh, it's important for us not just to look at our own lives, uh, but also to, you know, to know the purpose why God has planted here, us here, the purpose that he has put us here in this time and this season uh, so that we can be people who are able to, uh, you know, uh, bring others into the kingdom of God. Okay. So that is another uh, parable that he spoke about uh, the end of the age. Then there are two more parables that uh, Jesus talked about in uh, uh, this chapter 13 in verses 31 to 33 that reveals to us the power or the nature of the kingdom. And before we look at um, these two more parables in verses 31 to 33 that talks about the power of the nature of the kingdom of God, uh, we'll just ask, uh, any of you have any doubts, any questions to what has been said so far? Any questions? Sister, why, Sister, why was the parables explained only to the disciples when it was told for the whole group, whole crowd? So, like, um, uh, good question. So, we um, uh, saw in the beginning, right, um, when Jesus says that, uh, you know, they would, these people will be ever seeing, but uh you know they they will hear but they will not understand they will see but they will not uh, uh you yeah. know perceive okay with their hearts and their um, minds so we looked at in the in in the beginning of the chapter but he says uh in uh in verses 11 to 17 but it's the mysteries of the kingdom has been given to you okay so who is this you it's you know uh it's been given to those uh, you know, who know him, who believe in him. And so here also it's talking about the uh, disciples. And that is why, you know, we see that, you know, uh, uh, Jesus uh, tells them that, um, uh, you know, how did how do the disciples know that he was the son of God? Because he asks, who do you say I am? Some say that he's, uh, you know, Elijah, or some say he's one of the prophets. But, uh, you know, this, this was revealed to the disciples that Jesus was the uh, son of God. So even as Jesus um, was speaking to the people, okay, uh, and that is why he spoke in parables because he spoke in uh, things concerning their world and through the stories in their world, the reality in their world, he was re revealing the truths or the reality of his world. And, um, uh, he was unveiling the mysteries to them. But, you know, uh, uh, he, that's why he says that, you know, there will be, uh, they will hear, but they will not understand. They will see, but they will not uh, perceive because their hearts have grown dull. But he says, to you has been given the truth or the mysteries or the revelations of the kingdom of God. And so that is why he's uh, revealing the mysteries to the disciples um, uh, than to the people. But if the people wanted to understand, they would come to Jesus, they would ask, they would know. But, you know, these people, um, th their hearts have grown dull. That's what he says. You know, their hearts have grown dull. And he's saying that I'm, I'm telling them so that they can repent and they can understand. So he's revealing it to his disciples because he knows after he's gone, they will be the ones who will be able to reveal the mysteries of the kingdom of God and reveal the truth to the people. Okay, sister. Thank you. Yeah. So I, uh, uh, if you listen to my lecture, the first uh, last weeks, I have explained all of this. <laughs> Uh, you know, what are parables, why Jesus spoke to them in parables. And also we looked at, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, chapter 13, verses 11 to 17, uh, why Jesus spoke uh, these uh, parables, okay? Um, and he says to them in verses 10 to 17 that, you know, it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, meaning his disciples, and God has given them the grace uh, to know, know the mysteries of the kingdom okay so that is why we are saying that you know it's been given to us to know the mysteries of the kingdom and uh, we said that whoever has been given you know uh, and would be able to understand or will uh, uh, you know uh, get down deeper into the truths an abundance of revelation will be given to them but whoever does not 
uh, you know, care about what has been given to them. You know, if they don't bother, if they don't uh, perceive, they don't try to understand, they don't look into the truths, what has been given to them will also be taken away. Okay. So that is what we looked at in the, uh, uh, the first part of uh, when I was explaining uh, this chapter. I hope this helps, Lucy. Okay. Yes, sister. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Good question. Okay, if there are no questions, we'll move on to the two other parables that we see in chapter 13, verses 31 to 33. So can somebody else please read verses 31 to 33, please? Another parabola we put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man put in sword in the field, his food, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but, but when it is grow, it is there greater than heads and become a tree, so that the birds of air become the most in his branches. Another parabola he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like lean, which a which a woman took and hid in the three measures of meal till it was all leaving them. Leave it. Amen. Thank you, uh, Asapu. So here uh, Jesus is saying, here, look, I'm telling you something more about the kingdom of heaven. So the kingdom of heaven is like the mustard seed. Okay. So what is Jesus saying about the mustard seed? What is it? It's uh, the smallest seed. Yes, it is the smallest of all seeds. Uh, so, you know, he's saying even though it's the smallest of all seeds, but it has the potential where it is sown into the ground to take root, to grow into a big plant, you know, and the birds of the air can also come and nest in it. So he says the kingdom of heaven is like this mustard seed, which means the kingdom of heaven begins small. Okay, uh, it's it does not come with great uh, like a seed. It does not come with great uh, pomp, with show, with uh, you know, uh, 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 with the great uh, uh, exuberance, and you know, with the uh, kind of a. Uh, 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 you know, big show or something like that, but it's something very small. It looks very insignificant. It looks, um, you know, the seed looks lifeless. It has no potential for life, but that is how, you know, the kingdom of heaven, uh, heaven is like. It begins very, very small, but it, even though it looks small, it has the potential to influence. It has the potential to become pervasive. That means to enter into uh, any territory, any uh, sphere, any geographical area, and to infiltrate the entire environment or the entire uh, community or the entire city or the nation, the world at large itself, you know, and to have a greater influence and a greater impact because that is the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of God starts in a very small, insignificant way. There's no pomp show. There's no extravagance in, uh, in how it begins. But it has very uh, a powerful influence, very pervasive. And wherever it comes, it can just infiltrate and, you know, it can change the uh, environment. It can influence the environment in a greater degree, in a greater uh, measure. And he also continued on the same lines, uh, speaking of uh, how the power of the kingdom of God and how invasive it is and how powerful it is. He says that in verse 33, he says the kingdom of heaven is like uh, uh, leaven, like leaven or like yeast or baking soda that we use, you know, uh, to, um, uh, uh, you know, when we're making idli or dosa in, in India uh, or, you know, we're baking bread or cookies or donuts, you know, just putting a little yeast, a little baking soda um, uh, or leaven, you know, it kind of just works in the entire, entire dough. You know, it just uh, affects the whole dough to the to the extent that it makes it nice and soft and fluffy and, you know, uh, good and tasty to eat. Yes, uh, Gertrude? 
Uh, sister, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, there are believers who are praying and interceding for the uh, others who are, you know, not aligned with God. But why are they not uh, being influenced in a way uh, the power of God moves? Because we see a lot of uh, things that are happening, all wicked things. Uh, this is my question, sister. Oh, yeah. Thank you for your question. It's a good question. Yes, we pray for um, unbelievers. We pray for people who are struggling, who are going through challenges. We are praying for their salvation. But uh, we know that salvation is a free gift for everyone. But salvation is also, we know, is uh, uh, through faith, right? The person has to exercise their faith. Uh, yes, Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the entire mankind, but we know that automatically not everyone are saved, uh, you know, but only those who believe him by faith. And even the word of God says that, you know, those who seek me will find me. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's important that, you know, um, and, and God has not left anyone without a reason for them to know the true and living God. So if you look at uh, 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 Romans, you know, Romans chapter uh, 1, uh, God is, uh, you know, Paul is writing uh, to uh, the church at Rome and he's telling, hey, you Jews, you know, you have the law and through your law, you can come to know about uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, God, the Gentiles, you know, they have no law, but you know, they have no um, excuse because he's saying that, um, you know, God has made himself manifest to them. And how has God made himself manifest to them? Romans chapter 1, verse 20, he says, you know, creation reveals the invisible attributes of. God. So creation yes. reveals, uh, you know, the eternal power and the Godhead is all revealed in creation. And so Paul is saying that people are without excuse. Now we know that is not Paul writing here. Of course, he's writing it, but he's writing to the inspiration of the Holy um, Spirit. Yes. And so, you know, the Holy Spirit is revealing this to him and saying, hey, people are without excuse. It's very clearly mentioned here. So people are without excuse. Why are people without excuse? Because creation itself reveals the invisible attributes of God. It reveals yes. the Godhead. It reveals the eternal power. So people are without excuse. So no one can say, hey, I did not know God. So, you know, and when they look at creation and they seek the true and living God, the word of God says, those who seek me, I will make myself known to them, though they will find me. Those who are thirsty, I will pour myself out on. Um, them. Mm. So, uh, so what do we pray? We pray that God, you open their blind eyes that Satan has blinded them, open their minds that they will see your creation, they will know you, they will seek the true and living God, and they will uh, they will know that there's so much of futility in in the in the things that they are looking at, in the things that they are worshiping at, and there is no answer. And let them seek for the answer, and let them find you, because you're a God who reveals Himself to them. Thank you, sister. Yes, thank you, Gertrude. Good question, sister. So, but now they have made the creation only as the uh, idols. Yes. Um, Yes. So that is what Paul very beautifully again mentions in uh, uh, in chapter one of Romans. He's saying that although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God or gave him thanks. And, you know, because the futile thoughts and their foolish, their hearts were uh, darkened. Why? Because they they think they are very wise in their own eyes, but they became fools. And what, what happened as a result of that? He's saying very clearly in verse 23, they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. And also they went to, and this idolatry led them to immorality and every kind of sexual immorality and uh, uh, per perversiveness and it says they exchanged the 
uh, you know, the, you know, the, the, uh, the uncleanliness and the lust of the eyes and they exchange the truth of God for a lie and they worship this, uh, the creature, they worship the creature rather than the creator who's blessed forevermore. And for this reason, God gave them up to wild passions and the women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. So if you look at this very clearly, explains the pattern and the cycle. So God is saying, I reveal myself in creation. My invisible attributes are clearly seen there. So if people look at it, they uh, they reason, they think, they uh, seek, I, they will find me. But in spite of looking at those things and knowing that there is a son, they, you know, they, uh, uh, they became... Uh, they thought they were wise in their own eyes, but they are foolish. And what, what was the end result of it? They, you know, uh, 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 exchanged the glory of God to, uh, you know, to, to images made uh, like, uh, like the creatures, like man, like beasts. And they gave, uh, uh, you know, they worship those idols. And um, God is saying, uh, you know, um, and God gave them up to their uncleanliness and their lusts, okay? And and it led to dishonoring their own bodies. So it led to, led to every kind of uh, uh, sexual immorality um, and homosexual uh, sexuality and everything that came up was a result of this. So big cycle that is happening. And so we see this, this cycle, this pattern that is happening. And what does God say? I give you up to that. I leave you. See? Uh, and why? And we can ask, why is God giving them uh, up? He says, for this reason, God gave them up. I think in this chapter, he's, thrice he mentions God gave them up, you know, because they did not retain the knowledge, but they gave, and God, they did not uh, retain the truth in their minds. And God says, I gave you up to your debased mind, you know. So three times it's mentioned God gives them up. That means... Uh, why does God give them up? Because God has given us the free gift of volition, the free, uh, the free will to choose. God in his sovereignty has given us the free will to choose and that he does not in his sovereignty overstep his boundaries of the, the free will that he has given to us and step in and tell us what to do and what we shouldn't be doing. That is why he did not uh, stop Satan when, you know, or, or Adam and Eve when they were eating the fruit because he'd given the free will to choose. He told them the consequences of it in the same way with us, you know. So we are left, we, are, we have uh, uh, proofs, we have the reason, but when we give in to our own foolish thinking, God says, I give you up to your foolish thinking. I give you up to your debased mind. I give you up to your uncleanliness and to your lustful uh, and wild passions. Um, and he says, because of that, you know, all of these things have uh, happened. Thank you, sister. Yes. Thank you, Lucy. Okay, we'll continue. Um, there's no more questions. Any more questions? Okay, so in verse 33, he says, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like uh, yeast, leaven, baking soda. When you put little, you know, you don't have to put too much, just put little, you know, it just kind of uh, works and affects the entire dough. It makes it soft and fluffy, your bread or your cookie or your donut or your idli or those or whatever, you know, it comes out very uh, nice. So he says, you know, the kingdom of God is like that little leaven, just a little leaven, you know, but it has so much of power to affect the entire Tao. So also the kingdom of God uh, begins very small, in a small way, but it has such a powerful effect that it affects the entire uh, environment. Okay, so uh, where is this kingdom of God? Where is the in kingdom it? of God? Yes, in the, yes, the kingdom of God is in uh, us. So Jesus uh, said in Luke chapter 17, the kingdom does not come by observation, but the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within us. So this mustard seed, this leaven is within us. It's inside us. 
which means that, you know, uh, wherever we go, whichever environment we are in, or God has placed us, or God has planted us, he wants us to permeate, invade, and infiltrate his kingdom into that um, environment. Uh, so don't look at yourselves or don't let's not look at ourselves and say, hey, you know, God, I'm so small. I'm so insignificant. I don't have the potential. Yes, we might be small. Uh, we might be insignificant uh, uh, in our own selves. We don't have the potential in our own selves. We don't have that capacity. But hey, there is something more powerful inside us. And what is that? It's the kingdom of um, God and the kingdom of God. Uh, you know, has the power uh, that can invade, that can permeate, that can infiltrate and change the situation, that can change the uh, uh, environment, that can change the situation in your family, that can change this, uh, your own uh, situation in your own life, uh, in your workplace, in your business, in your, uh, uh, you know, amongst your family members, in your marriage, it can just have that power to infiltrate, permeate and move. And, uh, you know, you can uh, see what uh, the kingdom of God can do and how powerful it is. So there's something that's inside you that can affect your environment okay so the kingdom of god is in our midst and uh you know god desires that his kingdom that is so powerful be manifest be made known uh become a reality uh wherever he has uh, placed us okay so that is a powerful truth about just this two small things, the mustard seed and leaven. So we can be very small, we can be insignificant, but the kingdom of God that is in us is, uh, is great, is powerful, and is able to, you know, change uh, the environment and change the situation like we studied yesterday. You know, just small prayer groups um, that were started, just this man, you know, uh, William, who was uh, who was not eloquent, who was very slow in speaking, not a good preacher, just shared revival stories, just began the prayer group, and that led to a reformation uh, in his town and also in uh, the entire Scotland, okay? So that is how pervasive, powerful the kingdom of uh, God is. Amen? Okay? Okay. Um, so we'll move on. Um, there are two more parables that Jesus spoke to us uh, to reveal to us the value that we must place on his kingdom. Okay. So, so far we looked at, um, you know, the kingdom of heaven and how it is going to be in the, uh, the end of the age. And then we looked at uh, two parables that talks about how the kingdom of God is powerful, pervasive, that it can uh, invade, infiltrate, and permeate and change the environment. And there are two more parables that Jesus spoke to us in Matthew chapter 13 uh, that uh, reveal to us, you know, the value that we must place uh, in this kingdom. Yes, the kingdom of God is from eternity past to eternity future. It's everlasting. And uh, we, we saw what will happen um, in the end of the age, in the kingdom of God, we also saw that the word of the king of the kingdom is so powerful in the, the parable of the, uh, the sower and the seeds. We also saw that the kingdom of God can start very small, but it has the power to, uh, you know, uh, uh, invade and change our environment. And now we will look at the value that we must place on this kingdom or how we uh, should value this kingdom. So let's look at these two parables in Matthew chapter 13 verses 44 to 46. So can somebody else read uh, verses 44 to 46, please? Matthew 13, 44 to 46, anyone? Shall I, sister? Sure, Lucy. Thank you. Again, the kingdom of God is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, 
who when he had found one pearl of great price went and sold all that he had and brought it amen amen so what jesus is saying here is listen here's the truth about this unseen kingdom you know if you really want to enjoy this kingdom or you really want to experience this kingdom then this is how you have to treat this kingdom you got to treat this kingdom like this man you know uh, when he saw the treasures in his field maybe he was digging this field and he you know uh, you know saw the treasure that was hidden in his field what did he do he went and he sold everything that he had uh because he wanted to buy that field okay um uh, because of that treasure because the treasure that was so much great greater worth than you know all of his years of hard work that he will put in or even the field uh, the the cost of the money that he's going to pay for the um, field okay so this man is working in this field and he is digging it and he sees his treasure then he goes and sells everything that he has just to buy that field okay or like the man who was looking for that one pearl okay and um, there was this businessman he maybe was having business in in pearls and you know he had an eye for uh, the best and the most beautiful and the precious and costly pearls and you know one fine day he found this pearl of great worth uh, great beauty very expensive but really uh, you know a a a a a a good treasure to have you know so what did he do he gave up everything maybe he sold all of his other jewelry all of the other pearls that he had and he sold everything because he just wanted to buy that one pearl which was very beautiful ex exquisite you know and also very very expensive and something of a greater value than anything that he had you know so he went and sold everything and he bought that one pearl so what is jesus saying he's saying you know listen this is how we must treat the kingdom of god you know for us the kingdom of god should be like that treasure in that field or it should be like that one pearl of great value and nothing else should be you know acceptable than the kingdom of god you know everything that we look at life and value in life our reason our purpose for living what we are doing here everything should be with kingdom perspective with kingdom mindset doing it for the kingdom of um, god so the question here is you know will you and i place such importance Uh, such value on the kingdom of god or is the kingdom just like you know a side thing that we do uh when we you know just read our bibles uh in the morning and pray or you know uh, when we attend church it's just like a thing that we do on sunday mornings you know uh like okay i have to go to church if you know let me go to church so that i can my week would be blessed uh, or i finish my ritual but you know just go and listen to what the pastor is preaching and coming back or is that kingdom of god more than those rituals that kingdom of god is your all in all it's like that pearl of great price is like that treasure in that field which you will just leave everything sell everything and say god i'm pursuing this uh, kingdom okay so that is the way jesus or god wants us to treat his kingdom okay uh, uh jesus said if you know if a man um, puts his hand to the plow and he looks back what does jesus say he is not fit for my kingdom that means what is jesus saying here is that you know i don't even want you to entertain second thought you know uh the only thought you must have is hey this is god's kingdom i'm part of god's kingdom i'm a son and daughter of god's kingdom i've uh, been transferred into the kingdom of light uh and now i'm a a, a heir of god co-heir with jesus christ and you know um uh, i'm part of this kingdom even though i have not fit god has enabled me to be part of that kingdom okay and so jesus is saying you know there is no you shouldn't have any second thoughts you know uh he's not even saying 50 50 all you need to do is give your 100% 
So are we willing to give up everything, sell everything just for the sake of that treasure? Are we willing to sell everything, give up everything just for that, uh, you know, pearl of great price? Uh, what Jesus is meaning here or what I'm saying here is not that we give up, you know, our lives, give up our families, give up our jobs, what God has called us to do and, you know, go and sit on some mountain and, uh, you know, just meditate on God's word and just say, God, your kingdom come. It's not, I'm not saying that, you know, or even Jesus is not saying that. Uh, and it's even if you do that, it's not going to do anyone any good. But what Jesus is saying here is that while we are busy in this world, while we are engaging, while we are doing what God has called us to do, while we are sons and daughters of the kingdom in the midst of this wicked and perversive generation, while we are doing what God has called us to do in the midst of this wicked and perversive generation, our entire life should be centered to and should revolve around the king and his kingdom. Saying, God, you know, um, I'm willing to give up everything, giving the, up, giving uh, riches, wealth, my job, family, whatever it is, you know, entertainment, just to seek your kingdom, just to, you know, uh, 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 release your kingdom, just to pray your kingdom come, just to speak your kingdom, just to invite people into your uh, uh, kingdom, okay? So that should... Uh, you know, be the center of our lives, where our life is centered and revolves around the king and his kingdom. Okay, we'll stop here, we'll take a break and we'll come back after the break. Thank you, everyone.